Welcome to our third installment on antebellum reformers, and in this lesson we'll be taking a look at women's rights and the abolitionist movement. The cult of domesticity, or the cult of true womanhood, kind of permeated America in the 19th century. And there was this belief that there were separate spheres, and a woman's sphere was in the home. Um, and it was kind of a refuge from the cruel world outside. And the belief was kind of that uh, as the woman's place was in the home, it was also on a pedestal. As it was kind of her role to civilize her husband and her family and help raise children correctly. In all reality, uh, the 19th century woman pretty much had the legal status of a minor. You know, she was unable to vote. Um, if she was single, she could own her own property. But once she married, she lost control of her property. She also couldn't initiate divorce, make wills, sign contracts, or bring suits in court without her husband's permission. But what we see is, as the 19th century progresses, women will kind of fight to try to um, make strides in society, as well as we see kind of a growing significance of mutual affection in marriage. So whereas in the 1800s, um, you know, the wife was supposed to be the, the model of piety and virtue and kind of tried to uh, extol the benefits of religion and moral indoctrination upon the men and children, you kind of get the idea that if the women had it their way, that it might be more um, as you see here on the screen. And so, whereas the women's rights movement grows out of the abolitionist movement, you see you know, several significant women rise to the forefront, including Lucretia Mott and probably the most significant leader, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And it was these two women that helped you know, uh, bring together uh, the, the first meeting to kind of push for more women's rights and equality, which met at the famous Seneca Falls Convention in New York in 1848. And in their Declaration of Sentiments, uh, written at Seneca Falls, uh, it was here where those who had gathered rejected the cult of domesticity, and they demanded that women be given the right to vote, and that married women be able to control their property just as their husbands do. And so you really kind of see um, you know, this women's movement uh, kind of gaining more strength throughout the 1800s. However, the movement that probably caused the most conflict, and obviously leads eventually to civil war, is the abolitionist movement. Now, um, by 1817, there was created what was known as the American Colonization Society. Now, even though these members you know, knew that slavery was an evil for society, um, they knew that, uh, that slavery had deep economic uh, importance uh, in America. And just to emancipate all the slaves probably really wasn't very realistic, as people would be too fearful of where would they go, would they start race wars, um, and people wouldn't want to just emancipate their slaves at a, on, a, on a whim anyways. And so what these um, co American Colonist Society members wanted was to gradually and voluntarily um, call for the emancipation of slaves and then pay for free passage for um, those former slaves and free blacks to, to be transported back to Africa. Now, eventually, the colony of Liberia is established in 1821 for that purpose. However, it never proves to really be all that popular. And even though there was this feeling of racism in the North still, and this fear of you know uh, competition with freed blacks for jobs, um, obviously that caused not everybody in the North to be on board with the abolitionist movement. However, you do see it continue to grow, grow strength throughout the 1830s, and by 1840, the Liberty Party is created, uh, which is the first attempt to kind of bring you know, the issue of abolishing slavery into the political arena. One of the most ardent supporters of abolition was William Lloyd Garrison of Boston, and in 1831, he establishes the anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, where he calls for the immediate and unconditional uh, emancipation of those southern slaves. Now, a few, few years later, 
1833, he also establishes the American Anti-Slavery Society, and they kind of continue the attack on Southern slavery. Uh, they also attack the um, colonization efforts, however, but they do continue their push for immediate emancipation. And then we also see uh, the anti-slavery movement continue to grow in strength as escaped slaves, like Frederick Douglass, uh, escape up to the north and start to tell stories and explain to those northerners, many of who had probably never seen slavery, um, and, and kind of understand what what was involved and what life was like. But they also did it um, through their writings um, by creating a multitude of books and papers and journals uh, like Douglas's North Star, which would expose, you know, freed blacks, whites, um, and everybody else uh, to the horrors of slavery. So whereas you had probably the most prominent free African American in Frederick Douglass, um, drumming up more support uh, for this anti-slavery uh, ideals in the North. Yet probably one of the most daring former slaves in Harriet Tubman as well. For it is said that she probably helped lead over 300 slaves um, to their freedom, uh, many of which were probably more daring slaves, which would tend to be maybe um, younger men. Um, but there were women and children as well, obviously. Uh, but there was probably, you know, like some a forty thousand dollar bounty out on here at Tubman um, that Southerners were willing to pay for her capture because she did lead so many slaves to their freedom along the fabled Underground Railroad. Now, even with the efforts of William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and many, many others. Um, we do see that the anti-slavery movement you know, gained support in the 1820s and 30s um, and continues to do so, obviously, up to the Civil War in the 1860s. But that's something that we'll look at in future lessons.